Hi folks, welcome to the first lesson of National 5, Unit 1, Key Area 2, Transport Across Cell Membranes. This is part one of a lesson where we're going to focus on basics such as the composition of the cell membrane and why only certain substances can pass through it by looking at one experiment in particular. In the next part of the lesson, we'll move on and look at diffusion and osmosis. Now, as usual, we have a few starter questions to begin with, so please pause the video here and write down your answers and then play it again once you're ready to go through them. Question number one is what is the function of the cell membrane? And question number two is what types of cell include a cell membrane as one of their structures? Both of these we covered in lesson one. Okay, so the function of the cell membrane, remember it controls entry and exit of substances or molecules into and out of the cell. For the types of cell that include a cell membrane, it's all four types that we went over in cell structure. So animal, plant, bacterial, and fungal cells. So as I said before, we're still in unit one, cell biology, and we're now on carrier two, transport across cell membranes. Today, we're gonna to try and identify the cell membrane and label its components and understand why the cell membrane is described as being selectively permeable. So your success criteria is that by the end of the lesson, you can identify a cell membrane, you can state the two components of the cell membrane, and you can describe and explain the, uh, the results of the model cell experiment. Okay, so this is just a reminder that we find cell membranes not only in animal and plant cells, like you can see here, but also in the fungal and bacterial cell types that we looked at last lesson. Now remember the cell membrane borders these cells. So in an animal cell, it's this part here. In a plant cell, remember it's the one on the inside out of the two, the cell walls, the one on the outside. Now we can't see the cell membrane um, with our naked eye. Um, but it actually has many pores in it, or tiny holes, and this relates to its function of allowing substances into and out of the cell. Now, if we magnify or zoom in on a small section of the cell membrane, like this one here, um, then this is what you'd be able to see. So this is an animal cell, and we've magnified this little bit here, and this would be what you'd be able to see if you zoomed in on this part of the cell membrane. It would look something like this. So this slide takes that picture and allows us to look at it in a bit more depth. So as you can see, there are two parts that make up the cell membrane. Usually you're asked this question in terms of what the cell membrane is composed of. So there are two things. One are these little circles with the tails coming down below them, pointing into the middle of the cell membrane. Um, as you can see, the circles, the heads on them stay on the outside and the tails point inwards. Um, and these are called phospholipids. Now it's really important that you write the full word here. In older textbooks or past papers, you might see lipids being accepted by themselves. This is no longer the case. So you need to use the word phospholipid for these. Now the rest of these molecules you can see, these white ones going across the membrane. Now some of them span the whole way across the membrane. Some of them only go through half of it. Some of them even sit on the outside of it here. Now, although these have different roles, some of which you'll learn a bit later in the course, for the moment, these are all proteins, and that's all you need to know. So to summarise before we move on, cell membrane is composed of two substances, proteins and phospholipids, and you should be able to label these and be able to draw the cell membrane as well. Now, a phrase you'll see a lot in relation to the cell membrane and its function, which remembers to control which molecules can enter and exit the cell, is the term selectively permeable membrane. Now, if we break this down, so permeable means to allow liquids or gases to pass through, um, and selectively means to choose. So all the term selectively permeable refers to is the fact that the cell membrane essentially chooses which molecules or substances can pass through it. Now your next task is the fussy membrane task. So what I need you to do is read the passage below, I'll also read along with you in a second, and copy and complete the table below. On one side, I want you to include the molecules that are small enough to pass through the membrane that you'll learn about through the passage. And on the right side, I want you to write the molecules that are too large to pass through the membrane. When you're done, we'll go through the answers. So a selectively permeable membrane is one which has tiny pores in it, so that only very small molecules can pass through easily. The cell membrane is an example of a selectively permeable membrane. Tiny molecules such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, water and glucose are small enough to pass through easily, whereas larger molecules like sucrose and starch are too large to pass across the membrane. So pause the video here, 
try and use that information to fill in the table below. Okay, so hopefully the bits you've chosen um, are picked out of that are shown here. So oxygen, carbon dioxide, water and glucose are all small enough to pass through the membrane, so they go on the left-hand side of our table. And on the right-hand side of our table, we have sucrose and starch, which are both molecules that are too big to pass through the membrane. So now what we've got time for is some quick questions just to check your knowledge so far. So for these, you should not be going back to look at your notes. You should be attempting to answer these from memory to make sure you're following everything so far. Once again, pause the video, write down your answers, and then we'll run through them together. Okay, so naming the two components of the cell membrane, proteins and phospholipids. What term is used to describe the fact the cell membrane only lets certain molecules in or out? selectively permeable. Explain why certain molecules can get through the cell membrane and others can't. It's because some of the molecules are small enough that they can easily pass through, whereas other molecules are too large. State the names of two substances that can move easily across the cell membrane. So any of the four that you put in your table, um, so carbon dioxide, oxygen, glucose, um, and the names of the two substances for number five that cannot move across the cell membrane, that'd be sucrose um, or starch, your two larger ones. There are ones other than these, and um, they're just some examples. So what we're gonna look, move on to now is to look at the first experiment in this topic. So since we can't actually carry this out in the lab just now, I'm going to go step by step through it and try and use a lot of diagrams and at one point a really short video to allow you to try and visualise how you would carry this out if you were in the lab. So the purpose of this experiment is to demonstrate how the cell membrane works in terms of it being selectively permeable. This is an experiment that's often referred to as being the model cell experiment and that's because um, due to real cell sizes being so small, if you remember rightly, we need a microscope to be able to see a cell, never mind the tiny cell membrane that surrounds it. So in order to visualise what's happening at the cell membrane, we use a larger model. So in place of the cell membrane, we're using something called viscin tubing. You can see that labelled in the diagram here. So this is a clear, what seems like a kind of plastic bag, um, which has really tiny holes in it. So it'll mimic a normal cell membrane with its pores. So the main thing to keep in mind here as we go through the next few slides and as we go through the experiment is that the viscin tubing in this diagram here, this little bag, this is representing or acting as the cell membrane. So to set up the experiment on the right, a dot is tie, um, not as tied at the end of the viscin tubing and a plastic dropper or pipette is used to fill the tube up with a mixture of starch and glucose, which are both carbohydrates. The other end of the tubing is then tied and the bag is rinsed under a tap in order to get rid of any excess glucose or starch which might have gotten onto the outside of the viscin tubing bag. Now that is a really important step is because if there's any glucose or starch on the outside of the bag when it gets put into the water then it could affect the final results and we'll come back to that later. Finally, the viscin tubing is placed into a boiling tube like the one shown in the picture and the tube is filled up with water and left for 15 minutes. Now I know that um, this is hard to visualise as you probably haven't seen viscin tubing before so I'm going to show you just now a really quick video of this in real life. The thing you want to do is you want to get a 20 centimetre long piece of dialysis tube. Take it to a sink, turn on the water and let it run under the water. And what you want to do is you want to rub it between your fingers and pretty quickly it will start to open up. You'll see it start to move. And then if you carefully try to get one end open and hold on to the other end, you'll see very quickly it turns into an actual tube. So this actually has water inside and it has turned into a tube that's open on both ends. Once you get to this point, you can let the water out. And then what you want to do on the one end is you want to tie off the end by just making an overhand knot. And now you have a tube that's been tied off on one end and now you can fill the dialysis tubing with the starch solution and the glucose solution and then tie off the other end. So let's go do that. Okay, so in this next part we have our dialysis tubing, we've put it under the water and we've tied off one end and we have one end open. Now we're going to fill about an inch of glucose solution in here and an inch of starch solution and you want to leave a good inch and a half 
at the other end so you can tie off the other end. And that's actually a good amount. You see how I have an inch of glucose solution. Now I'm going to add my starch solution. That's actually a plenty, a big enough cell. And I still have enough left over to tie it off. So now you want to carefully push all the excess down, twist the cell, and then tie off the end. And there you have your nice cell. All right, here we are back at the sink, and we have our cell tied at both ends. I'm going to make sure that I turn the water on and rub my fingers back and forth and really rinse out, rinse the cell and rinse the ends to make sure that there's no excess glucose or starch solution on the outside of the cell. Okay. The now the quick reminder about glucose and starch, it's using the molecules we've just put on the inside of our risk and tubing bag, so inside our model cell. Although both of these are carbohydrates, you can see by the pictures here their sizes are very different. As you can see, glucose is a small molecule, this one here, and it's a sugar that's found in a lot of the foods you eat. Um, you might have heard of this in most of the kind of things like energy drink, where it says where it has added glucose. In the comparison, you can see starch is a very large molecule, which is actually made up of a lot of glucose molecules joined together. You'll have heard of starch before in terms of starchy foods like potatoes and pasta. So again, please keep in mind this difference between these two as we go through the rest of the experiment. So now that we've left our visking tubing with glucose and starch on the inside and water on the outside in this boiling tube for 15 minutes, we now need to test and see our results. Now the issue is that glucose and starch are so small that we can't see them. We need to test their presence or absence in a different way and it's important that you understand these tests and how to do them. So firstly we're going to test and see if the water in the boiling tube, so the water around the outside um, of the visking tubing now contains glucose or not. So by doing this we are asking has glucose managed to get across from our model cell inside the visking tubing through the membrane into the water around about it. To test um, this we use something called Benedict's reagent or solution. Now Benedict's is usually a blue colour, you can see down here. Um, and you add it to a solution to test it to see if it contains glucose. And to do this, you have to heat it up in a water bath like this one. Um, and if there is glucose there, it will turn a bright orange colour. So we know if glucose is present in the water or not, because if we add it to Benedict's and heat it, if it turns from blue to orange, then it means the glucose is present in the water. If it stays blue, then it isn't. Now, Benedict's reagent only works for simple sugars such as glucose, so we need a different test for starch. So the tech second test we need to do is we need to test whether starch managed to get across the model cell membrane represented by the visking tubing into the water around it. So what we do is we use um, another solution called iodine to test the water this time. So the iodine is normally a brownie orange colour as you can see in this picture down the bottom. Um, and if it stays this colour when the water is added to it, it means it doesn't contain any starch. However, if it turns to a blue or black colour, that means the water did contain starch and that would tell us that the starch has managed to pass from the inside of the visking tubing through the membrane out into the water. Now, before we look at results, what I want you to do is I want you to think about what you think would have happened. So if we carried out this experiment in class, what do you think would have happened? Now, this is what we call a hypothesis, is you predicting what you think will happen in the experiment. So do you think glucose would manage to pass across the cell membrane? And do you think that the starch has managed to cross, uh, to cross the cell membrane or visking tubing? So pause the video, have a wee think. OK, so let's look at our results. So the water in the boiling tube actually tested positive for glucose. So that meant the Benedict's reagent must have turned from blue to orange when it was heated. And the water in the boiling tube tested negative for starch, so the iodine solution must have stayed an orange colour and not turned to a blue-black colour. Now, you need to be able to explain this in terms of the cell membrane, and this is where our differences we discussed earlier between the sizes of glucose and starch becomes really important. Now, if we look at the wee representation of the experiment on the right-hand side, the glucose molecules are represented by the little green dots because the glucose molecules are small, like I mentioned before. Um, now, they manage to pass across the membrane because of their size. They can pass through the visking tubing, which remember represents our cell membrane, and out into the water, so just like they could pass through the cell membrane. And that's why when we tested using Benedict's reagent for glucose, we found the glucose molecules on the outside. 
On the other hand, the starch molecules are represented by the large red circles. They are much bigger, and because the membrane is selectively permeable, they are too large to pass through. Therefore, we didn't find any on the outside of the visking tubing in the water, so the iodine test was negative. Now, although this is only a model, it demonstrates that small molecules like glucose, along with other small molecules like oxygen, carbon dioxide and water, can easily pass through the cell membrane, whereas larger molecules such as starch and sucrose cannot. Before we move on, it's really important that you understand this experiment, as there are experimental questions that come up in the National 5 exam. So I want you to pause the video here and try these questions, and then play it again when you're ready to go over them. So number one, what does the visking tubing represent? So the visking tubing represents the cell membrane. What was detected in the water surrounding the visking tubing? That was glucose. Three, what was not detected in the water surrounding the visking tubing? Starch. Why were these molecules detected or not detected? So glucose was detected because it was small enough to pass through the visking tubing membrane into the water, whereas starch was too large, so it couldn't pass out. Number five, why was it necessary to rinse the outside of the visking tubing before placing it into the boiling tube? So now we know, if you think about it, if starch or glucose was accidentally left on the outside of the visking tubing as a kind of mistake when you were putting the mixture inside of the star before it was put into the water, you would find both of these in the water when you tested it at the end of the experiment. And that wouldn't be because either of them had managed to pass through the membrane. It would just be because they were on the outside to start with. So that's why it was really important to rinse it. So finally, what we're going to do is we're going to look at two categories of transport across the cell membrane, which is going to be our focus for the rest of the lessons on this topic. So molecules can move across the cell membrane in two ways, through passive transport or through active transport. You must know the difference between these two methods. So the main difference is that active transport uses energy, whereas passive transport does not require energy. The way to remember this is that if you're active, think about being active, then you're using energy, whereas passive you're not using energy. So within this lesson, we have learned to be able to identify the cell membrane, to be able to state the two components of the cell membrane, and now I'm hoping you can describe and explain the results of the model cell experiment. So now go on and watch the next lesson to find out more about passive and active transport.